Um, so uh, this is this is uh, uh, a study we did with uh, my friend Benjamin Davis, uh, and it's not going to tell you anything about the past. So if you're not agent-based modeler or you're not planning to be an agent-based modeling, then do yourself a favor uh, and just go for uh, for for a cocktail. <laughs> um, what we aim to do is we were interested <clears throat> in who are agent-based modelers in in uh, archaeology. So we run a survey. We advertised it really badly because we mostly use social media. We ran it over uh, four weeks and we got 65 responses, most of which in the first week, which kind of made the rest of the time worthless. Um, there are obvious biases to this survey because, uh, I mean, obviously we, we advertise it on Twitter and send emails, so, uh, so there is probably over representations of members of our per professional networks. Uh, it is very likely we have way more English speakers than non-English speakers. Uh, we are likely to have attracted more younger researchers because they use Twitter. Uh, and uh, for all sorts of reasons, uh, it is more likely that male researchers replied in a higher frequency than female researchers. So those are all the biases that you should keep in mind. There might have been others, but, um, uh, but those are the main ones, we think. <clears throat> so there we go. Let's go. Agent-based modelers in archaeology are in general blokes. There are some women, but there are not many of them. And we tried to kind of counteract the, the biases of like, you know, there's a very often a, a guy would take one IBM course and he would reply to the, to the survey because he's an agent-based modeler. Uh, whereas the women are a little bit more shy and they're like, well, I build a model, but can I call myself an agent-based modeler? I don't know. So we, we, we did actually email Twitter and attract uh, females to reply as much as we could, and that still came up with that result. Um, their academic age, uh, so the number of years since they are uh, obtained a PhD, uh, or a master, but I don't think there were any, any one of those, uh, shows that they're mostly young, so they're either still PhD students or they just graduated, and there's a bit of a blip around, yeah, they're much older, uh, which probably indicates uh, the wave of uh, modeling that happened in the 70s, uh, and those people happily uh, are not retiring from archaeology. But in general, this is a new phenomenon, uh, and it is for that reason. We hope it's uh, it's dynamic, and uh, it's let's hope most of those people will go on uh, in academia. Um, when you when you break it into uh, into gender, you can see that most of those young academics are actually female. This is a frequency, so. Um, so this basically tells you that most of females that we asked are actually in the young age, young academic age category, whereas guys are way more kind of equally distributed. Uh, and then what are they doing right now? Well, good news everyone, a lot of them are in permanent academic positions. So if you're thinking about and, you know, what to do with your life, this may be a good shot. So there's equal number of, almost equal number of people in permanent academic positions and those that are doing PhD at the moment. Obviously, it is likely that those that did PhD are not in permanent academic position. We just didn't get their answers because they're probably working for Google, right? So we just don't know about them. Um, but uh, there's also some other ones. So this is great news, except for if you're a woman. <laughs> I mean, if you're a woman and you're planning on doing agent-based modeling or doing it now, then uh, please come to me and we're going to go to a pub to cry together. 90% um, of those that are in permanent uh, academic positions are male and only one respondent was female. Um, on the other hand, those that are doing the PhDs in agent-based modeling, there's mo they're mostly women. Uh, great news, right? <laughs> right. Who who are they? Where where are they from? Do they do they come from other disciplines, or are they archaeologists that basically learn how to code? Um, it turns out they're mostly from humanities, anthropology, and archaeology, so Americans and then Europeans. Um, and there's a but the second most most important component is people coming from STEM subjects. So so it's mostly homegrown people. Uh, and there's some, some people that come from the heavy technical uh, disciplines. The interesting thing is there's not many people that came that had a background, the first degree, in social sciences. And that's a little bit weird because we, 
we have the same questions, we have very often uh, the same theoretical models, and the fact we don't have that many social scientists doing it is, is, is kind of weird. Um, and then what is their kind of, we call it theoretical heritage, we ask them, if you were to name one theoretical framework as the one that drives you, which one would it be? Uh, and there's an equal division between complexity science and evolutionary theory. So those will be people that are doing like cultural transmission, social learning, this kind of stuff. Uh, and some people just say, I, I, what they already are talking about, I'm using simulation because that's a technique, computational learning, I use whatever. No, there's, no, there's no theory. There is theory, but they just don't say it. Um, not many people are coming from archaeological theories. Not many people would say, oh yeah, you know, I'm kind of Benfordian or I'm middle range theory or whatever. Which is, again, interesting because we do have archaeological theories that lend themselves very well to ABM and, and other uh, simulation techniques, yet people don't seem to be coming from that theoretical, for theoretical uh, angles. And, okay, so, so now, now we know who they are and who do they work with. So this is the people we, the background of the people we, um, we surveyed, and this is who they worked with, okay, on the other side. So, and you can see humanities basically works mostly with life sciences and, and STEM subjects, um, uh, and not much with social science, again, and not much with other people coming from humanities, which is, again, surprising because social science has much better developed field of agent-based modeling, so, you know, you could just literally pick up their models and, and, and bash it here and just kind of change the date from 1995 to minus 19, 1995. Um, so this is a very interesting pattern. It looks like uh, so the, all those archaeologists and anthropologists are basically going to people that have techno, technical knowledge, probably of coding, or they can do their data or they have uh, some better math skills and, and work with them rather than with other social scientists. Um, and, uh, Whereas the, the people with kind of the diverse background, they, they kind of work with everyone almost equally. Moving on. Everyone uses NetLogo, is the conclusion. Um, so uh, the, 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 the only kind of wiggle on that was that uh, it, there seems to be this pattern that people use NetLogo to, uh, to do a simulation and they analyze the results in R. But in general, NetLogo is completely dominating the field. Um, and this is the, another point to cry about. 75% uh, of agent-based modelers in archaeology, they actually learn it themselves, which is horrendous when you think about it, because it's highly technical and difficult skill, and those poor people had to sit there and, and cry over their code. Uh, just like me, just like me. Just saying. So what type of models do we, do we, do we work on? Um, we use uh, we ask people about the, uh, the type of validation they use because that's a very good proxy where on the theory to data uh, data driven and theory driven uh, models where on this the spectrum you are and uh, and there's a good mix of of, of 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 both types there's quite a lot of abstract models that just don't do any validation like if you've been here earlier I was showing the shelling model of segregation in cities. And, and that's like a, ty a type of a, an abstract model. Leonard's model was pretty abstract. Um, and then uh, you know, and then you have data data driven models which you compare against data. So so we're kind of we're fine. We're we're well healthy mix. Um, and uh, and in terms of scales, it looks like we're going more for the kind of finer finer uh, scale. So like one agent would be on one individual rather than like one culture. This is great because agent-based modeling is, is done in agents, so you don't want to model a whole country as an agent. Um, and usually the, the scale of the temporal scale is about longer than a day, but shorter than a season or a year. I, th I think this is uh, partially driven by agricultural models that kind of have the one year scale. So those are the scales. And the topics that are mostly modeled, uh, there is, there is, uh, uh, there are the abstract models that are the most common, but they're one category. Uh, those two are both uh, Europe. So it looks like Europe is dominating in terms of being a topic, which is interesting because from my personal experience, quite a lot of Americans do agent-based modeling, but they seem to still apply it to, to topics related to Europe. And 
and if you would like to learn to know more about it, there's a paper that will tell you all of that in uh, more details. And more importantly, all of the data and analysis is available on GitHub, and you can just have a look and uh, and learn more about the agent-based modelers in, in archaeology. The other author could not be with us because he is as far as uh, Andy's horticulturalist. Uh, <laughs> And I think it's a winter there as well. Um, but uh, any questions, ask me or email Ben. Thank you.